Hi, my name is Angela Zoss. I work as an assessment and data visualization analyst at Duke University Libraries. Duke University sits on land that has long served as the site of meeting and exchange amongst a number of indigenous peoples, historically the Shikori, Catawba, and Eno people. I honor these people today by recognizing that this institution of higher education is built on unceded land. It is also important to recognize that the eight tribes that currently reside in North Carolina. These include the Koheri, Lumbee, Meharan, Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, Haliwa Saponi, Wakamasuan, Saponi, and the Eastern Band of Cherokee. I honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which I live and work. I honor these people today by recognizing them in order to break the cycle of colonization and the continued erasure of indigenous peoples. As part of this acknowledgement, I am taking time to learn more about the history of the area where I live and work, the role of my institution in the colonization of this area, and the ways that both higher education institutions and disciplines like data visualization and information science create and perpetuate harm to indigenous peoples. I encourage you to join me in exploring ways to support indigenous peoples near your home and workplace and through the work you do. Thank you. As you learn about data visualization, it should become apparent that each visualization is a product of a variety of choices made by creators of the data set and the visualization itself. For every component of the visualization, there are alternatives to how it could, be, could have been generated, organized, described, or styled. When you try to understand what it is possible to learn from a visualization, you need to approach the visualization with a critical eye, comparing the visualization as it is with what you know about the alternative choices that could have been made. You may not know the full story of how a visualization was created, but in every visualization, there are clues to how it was created that can inform your decision about how to interpret what you see. The first step to approaching a visualization with a critical eye is to understand the original context of the visualization. First, there is where the visualization was originally published. When visualizations are designed, they are often made to work well in a particular publication medium, like a print publication, versus a website. They may also be designed for a specific intended audience, which can affect the type of the chart, the style of the chart, the terminology used for the text, etc. As part of that design work, the designer may have simplified the visualization or focused in on a small part of the story. The visualization may also have been embedded within a context that provided extra details. There may have been additional information in the surrounding documentation, or the visualization could have been part of a series of visualizations that all work together to explain trends in the data. The context of the visualization helps you understand what the original goal of the visualization might have been, and it can help explain why certain parts of the story are emphasized in a particular way. It could even be the case that the original context reveals a bias that is influencing the design of the chart, and we'll return to that topic shortly. Here is an example of a way that audience can influence the design of a visualization. Take a look at the infographic shown here. The data set is carbon emissions by nation, both total emissions and per capita emissions. The visualization was originally published in a magazine called Miller McCune, which reported on issues of social and environmental justice. For a publication venue like a magazine, graphics often need to be a bit flashier and more engaging than you might expect in a publication more oriented to the scientific community. In, the, in this case, the visualization plays off the idea of carbon footprint by arranging the data visualization into the shape of footprints. In contrast to that style, a similar data set visualized for the scientific community might take a more generic approach, including using a common visualization type like a map and using a simple visual encoding like color to represent the data. The map is also much simpler than the infographic in that it has no additional labeling or explanation. When you see a visualization, you should look for clues about the original context. You can see if there is a note on the chart somewhere about where it was published or who the creator was. You can even do an internet search for the title of the visualization or a reverse image search to try to find the original place where the image was published. 
Visualizations are very easy to take out of context, appearing in a tweet or a news clip, without giving the audience much of an opportunity to form their own understanding of what they say. Before you take the visualization at face value, make sure you understand where it came from and who it was designed for. Another way to approach visualization with a critical eye is to focus on the data used in the visualization. A completed visualization is often very polished, giving the appearance of tidiness and accuracy. Often though, the data behind the visualization are messy, incomplete, or inconclusive. Getting accustomed to thinking about the data behind the visualization can help you question the conclusions presented in the visualization, as well as understand the hidden work behind the creation of a visualization. When you see a visualization, think about how the data used in the visualization were collected. Is the visualization based on a lot of data or just a little? Do the data cover a range of possible sources or was the data collected from just one small group of a population? What was the original intention of collecting the data? And does the visualization explore that original intention? Even data that is collected and pro processed in an appropriate manner can be manipulated to support a different conclusion than was intended. This type of manipulation is often related to the individual or group that collected, processed, and visualized the data. Might they have a hidden agenda in performing this work? Finally, a visualization should readily share information about the data it, it is based on. If it is difficult to find information about how the visualization was created, the process may have been untrustworthy, or the visualization itself may have been doctored to hide this information. Not only is it important to make sure that, cr that creators get full credit for their work, it is also important to be able to verify that a visualization is based on trustworthy data practices before it is considered a reliable source of information. In this example, data from a survey of fans of the FIFA World Cup is summarized with the following headline. Majority of fans favor more frequent men's FIFA World Cups. In the visualization, 55% of responses are labeled as desiring more frequent World Cup events than the status quo, which is to have a World Cup every four years. On Twitter, however, there was some critique of this interpretation of the data. The breakdown of the data shows that there were four options in the survey question about FIFA World Cup frequency, every one year, every two years, every three years, and every four years. Three out of the four options were more frequent than the status quo. And when the data is broken down, the status quo of every four years is actually the most popular option. The original chart is not inaccurate, but the original survey question was already biased toward increasing the frequency of the FIFA World Cup and aggregating the three less popular choices to create a total that is more popular than the status quo has been seen as manipulating the data to support FIFA's agenda of increasing the frequency of the World Cup. A visualization is a tool for exploring and understanding data. As with other ways of exploring data, a visualization presents an argument, a claim about how the data should be understood. To approach the visualization with a critical eye, you should question what argument the visualization presents and whether or not the argument is compelling based on what else you know about the subject matter. The first thing to establish is the intended message of the visualization. Is a part of the data being emphasized? Are there other aspects of this subject matter that might be missing, like additional data sources or concurrent events that might be influencing the data? Next, it is important to question the assumptions implicit within the data set and visualization. Is the chart arguing that the data trend is problematic, unusual, caused by another phenomenon? An argument may also draw power from aligning with established worldviews, at least for audiences who are expecting data that align with their world worldview. For other audiences, the reverse may be true. An argument that challenges an established worldview may be seen as more credible. This kind of connection to worldview may embed in the visualization assumptions that are difficult to see and challenge, meaning that we may miss ways the visualization argues for things that are not necessarily supported in the data. Finally, the argument of a visualization might be reinforced by the aesthetics of the visualization. The style of the chart, 
the way that it uses color, fonts, even the type of chart it selects, all contribute to the tone of the visualization. Aesthetics can contribute to the visualization being seen as authoritative, scary, playful, or hopeful. Understanding how the argument of the visualization comes through in its design makes it easier to unpack the message and critique whether or not the argument is well supported by the data. This example comes from an area of heated debate in the United States. The services provided by Planned Parenthood, an organization that provides a variety of reproductive health care services, including services around abortions. This first chart was created and distributed by an organization called Americans United for Life, an organization in favor of abortion restrictions. The chart summarizes its message explicitly in its subtitle, Abortions Up, Life-Saving Procedures Down. The message is supported by the two lines that cross in the chart, a downward trending line for cancer screening and prevention services, and an upward trending line for abortions. The aesthetics of the chart also reinforce the idea that abortion services are problematic by using the color red to evoke harm and danger, perhaps even blood. The use of a pink or lavender color for cancer screening may be an intentional reference to the pink ribbon used to promote breast cancer awareness. This second chart was published by Vox.com in a response to the first chart. Like the first chart, it shows two lines, one with a downward trend and one with an upward trend. Also like the first chart, the starting and ending points of each line are labeled with the corresponding data values. Unlike the first chart, though, both lines are displayed using the same y-axis, showing that the scale of each category of services is actually quite different. When displayed on the same axis, the two lines do not cross at all, and the increase in abortions appears much less drastic than the decrease in cancer screenings. In relative values, cancer screenings decreased by 53% during this time period, while abortions increased by 13%. But even this is not the complete story. What else might be missing from this chart? Notice first that each line is made up of only two data points, the numbers from 2006 and 2013. What is happening between those data points? Why only go back to 2006? These charts also show the total number of people served. How might the raw totals be affected by changes in total population amongst the populations served by the organization, or the number of Planned Parenthood health centers in operation, or other national events? Finally, are these the only two types of services provided by Planned Parenthood? How do these numbers compare to the numbers for other services? A final version of this chart fills in many of those gaps. Here we see how the data changes year to year across the time span, and we also see that there are six categories of services provided by par Planned Parenthood. In this chart, cancer screening is the yellow line, and abortion services is the purple line toward the bottom of the chart. This chart shows the decline in cancer screening in the context of other more popular services, contraception in red, and STI slash STD testing and treatment in blue, which seems to have increased by about 50% across this time span. Discussions about the data have suggested possible explanations for the decline in cancer screening, including the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which provided health insurance to many who were previously uninsured, and changes to cervical cancer screening guidelines that also happened around that time. While the original chart uses accurate data, it uses problematic visualization techniques to misrepresent the trends, and it also makes an argument that the trends are highly problematic, an argument it reinforces with its tone and color choices. Different choices regarding what to include in the chart, how to display the data, and how to style the chart support different arguments. In the previous example, the different design choices of the final version of the chart did not just support a different argument. By including additional detail, such as the annual data points, the visualization actually exposes data that can be useful in interpreting the trends. That is, the cancer screening line has a sharper decline after 2009. This is an example of the kind of impact a chart can have on its audience. 
When viewers have the amount of detail they need to make an informed interpretation of the visualization, that visualization is empowering the audience to come to its own understanding rather than directing the audience toward a narrow interpretation and obscuring anything that does not fit with that interpretation. Another way a visualization may have an impact on its audience is that the visualization can be a source of benefit or harm to the audience. If there is a population portrayed in the visualization, are they portrayed respectfully with their anonymity protected if desired? Is the chart designed such that the study population would understand it or would it need translation? For a chart to benefit its audience, it should also be clear and easy to use, designed in order to be accessible to the largest audience possible. During the 2020 US presidential election, CNN aired this graphic summarizing the result of their exit polls. Describing the racial identity of voters, the graphic uses something else to describe voters not represented by the other racial categories. The Native American and indigenous communities lumped into this descriptor were quick to denounce the harm done by a term like something else. The choice of something else is dehumanizing, coming across as more insulting even than terms like other which are commonly used to aggregate smaller demographic categories. But any aggregation may cause unintended harm. Native people and communities face regular erasure in data sets, and efforts are increasing to move away from overly broad racial categories and generic terms that hide the influence of specific groups. With all visualizations, choices are made that can have a lasting impact on the audience, and very real harm can be done by distributing a visualization that reinforces an oppressive worldview, either actively or through omission. As you encounter visualizations in your daily life, and possibly even create your own, make sure to take the time to question the choices that created the visualization. Keep an eye out for language, aesthetics, or visualization techniques, that may be promoting a distorted or harmful view of the data. Approach visualizations critically, and if they are unclear, untrustworthy, distorted, or harmful, make sure you are interpreting them with care or not at all. This video is part of a series of lectures recorded to teach about basic data visualization concepts. It was designed by members of the Visualizing the Future Symposia project and was made possible in part by a National Forum grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. This content is designed to be used freely. See the video description for more information about this lecture series and the Visualizing the Future Symposia project.